All right. Good morning, CNS. Hope you had a good night. Uh, I'm Thomas Novotny. I'm currently the Vice President of OCNS. And uh, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the second keynote, Joseph Lizier, right over here. Joe commenced his scientific journey uh, with a BSc in science and in electrical engineering, and then took 10 years in industry to figure out that actually he wouldn't want to be an academic and came back uh, doing a PhD at the University of Sydney, uh, then followed by postdocs, uh, places I, I know and like, uh, <laughs> at, universe, uh, in, um, at Leipzig, at the in, um, Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences, and then coming back to Sydney at CSIRO, um, uh, which is a research organization in Australia, um, where I met him first, uh, some 10 years ago now, I believe. You know, we're all getting older. Uh, and then um, from there on, uh, he eventually changed to uh, University of Sydney, first as a lecturer and now as an associate professor. And uh, in his research, Joe does everything about information dynamics, its applications. And today he will talk about these tools, I presume, um, for information processing in brains. And so without any further ado, Joel, the stage is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for a lovely introduction. Uh, that was very well prepared, actually. I couldn't even remember sending that to you guys months ago, so I'm very impressed that you remembered all that. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Thomas. Thank you also to the Organising Committee and Program Committee for inviting me to give the talk today. It's a real honour, particularly to be considered in the company of, of Michael and Tara and Kristen. And it's particularly flattering because I still don't feel like a neuroscientist. And it's not from lack of trying. I've been coming along to OCNS, uh, this is my, my eighth time that I've been here. I've been involved in the Organising Committee for the Methods of Information Theory and Neuroscience Workshop for the last seven iterations. But I still don't know my basal ganglia from my locus ceruleus. And maybe that's okay, because I'm not a neuroscientist. What I am is a computer scientist slash engineer whose research area is about uh, studying information processing in complex systems in general. I'm very passionate about bringing these skills and tools to bear in computational neuroscience. And thinking about this talk, I've been reflecting a lot on the way I've gone about contributing in this field. And it really comes down to the nexus between the theory about what information processing in complex systems is, producing enabling tools to allow us to study this empirically from real data, and then making the applications to further our insights into these systems. I call the talk about enabling tools uh, for studying information processing because really that's the glue that holds all of these together. But the intersection between all three is what I'm going to focus on really. That interaction between these three components of research says a lot about the way that I've worked in this field and in particular about the way I've collaborated. And the collaborations have been key. I've learned a lot, an awful lot from my collaborators in neuroscience over the years and I wouldn't have been able to contribute in this field without them. That includes my own students and postdocs whose work will form some of what I'll present in this talk, as well as my collaborators internally, particularly Max Schein and Ben Fulcher who are here, and externally, uh, particularly Mikhail Vibral from Göttingen, Viola Prisman, Patricia Volstadt, and Pedro Mediano from Cambridge. So I mentioned that my research area is about information processing in complex systems. So let's start by unpacking that a little. It's a tautology to say that the brain processes information. We talk a lot about that, about the way that the sensory system takes in information from the environment, the way that information is transferred from one region of the brain to the other, the way that that information is stored in particular areas during a cognitive task, and the way that those pieces of information are combined in some non-trivial fashion in order to make uh, new information and new decisions. But I think about this in more of a wider context of complex systems in general, because we use the same terminology to talk about information processing in a lot of other systems. For example, we look at schools of fish and we talk about the way that when one fish turns to avoid a predator, that sends an implicit communication to the next fish who turns little as well, which causes another fish to turn and another fish and so on, until we have a cascading wave of information passing across the school as a whole, 
causing them to turn and avoid the predator. We talk about the way fireflies synchronize using implicit communication in their flashing to store information in the phase of their flashing and to make non-trivial information processing decisions about whether to speed up or slow down their flashing based on what others are doing. We talk about the way that ants compute the most efficient routes between food and the nest. And we talk about how information is processed in canonical complex systems like my favourite, the cellular automata. So how can we then model information processing in complex systems when we see it all around us in this way? A first approach is to think about how computation is approached in computer science, of course. There, the primary theoretical abstract model for computation is the Turing machine, which is a deterministic state machine that operates on an infinite tape. We have very well-defined inputs and outputs for the machine being the tape that data is read from and written back to. We have a well-defined algorithm or task being the program inside the machine itself and a terminating condition or a halt state. What the machine does is it has a little reading head and it cycles through a process where it reads what's written on the tape, where it's currently positioned. It decides what to write back to the tape at that position based on what it read, what the internal program or algorithm is telling it to do and its current state. Then it decides to move the head somewhere else. And again, that's decided based on what it just read, what the program is and what its current state says. And finally, it will update its current state, again, based on those three inputs and perhaps move to the next instruction or hold. But does this really help us to understand biological computation if we try and apply it to that? And I'd say not really. Taking the flock as an example that we looked at before, we know that we can implement this on a Turing machine. We can implement it, uh, say, in the NetLogo Net logo program that I have running on my computer, and we can see very realistic looking flocks moving around. Does it help us to understand information processing in nature though? And I'd say not really. The problem is not that the brain or any other complex system is not a Turing machine. That's kind of a moot point. It really misses the, the main point here. The point is that it, it just doesn't tell us anything useful about the information processing that's going on inside the system. It doesn't add to our knowledge. So we seem to need a new perspective here if we want to understand how information is processed in these systems. Melanie Mitchell said that if we want to understand computation in complex systems, perhaps the language of dynamical systems may be more useful than the language of computation itself. And I really agree with that point. A way we can look at that is to think of the concept of intrinsic information processing, which Feldman says occurs whenever a system undergoes a dynamical process that changes its initial state plus some inputs into some later state plus outputs. And we can understand this if we look at uh, the brain as an example, where we start in some initial state where I've used colours to show different activities in different regions of the brain. We take some inputs, then the brain undergoes some dynamical process to end up in some final state, shown by different uh, activity uh, patterns here, and outputs as well. So we refer to uh, information being processed here from the initial states and the inputs into some final states and outputs here. So we can recognise uh, inputs and outputs and an algorithm taking place here as well. Now this is a very inclusive view of what computation or information processing is. And we can identify this as occurring in any of the systems that we looked at before. But it's not really enough. We really need to make these notions a bit more precise. It's one thing to be talking about computation, but we want to be able to model and measure it. So how can we do that? We need to go further and recognise that computation or information processing isn't just about the mapping of inputs to outputs at the global level, but it's happening in the interactions inside the system. It's happening in many places in space and time inside the system in that dynamical process. And so that's what we really need to start to try and dig into. So as a starting point, we can reflect on how information processing or computation is talked about. And the way that I talked about it in these examples before, we could say that we talk about memory, for example. We talked about the fireflies storing information in their current phase. We talked about signaling, for example, the way that the movements of the fish intrinsically signal each other about what's going on. And we talked about processing in the way that the individuals in these systems combine information from each other's with their own in order to make updates to their own states. And that's happening at many points in space and time across the system.
So what we're trying to do, really, is to model computation or in, in, information processing in the language that it's normally described in. And if we can do that, that should allow us to better understand, for example, neural information processing and its deficiencies. What we're trying to do is to quantitatively model information processing in ways that allow us to answer meaningful questions about these operations on information in neuroscience. So what we do is translate the way we talk about computation into measures that we can actually uh, empirically estimate. So we're going to try and model computation in terms of how information is stored within, uh, within the system in a distributed fashion, how it's transferred between the entities, and how it's modified. So I spent a bit of time motivating, uh, motivating why we're interested in modeling information processing in the brain. And I'm going to start to get towards how we actually do that. I'll start with some background about what information is, uh, what information theory is, then we'll move on to how we use it to model information processing, and then look at some examples of what this can reveal about information processing in the brain. So when I'm teaching uh, information theory, I always like to start with guess who. It was a great childhood game. Uh, so let's have a, a quick look at that and play it. Oops. Okay, wait a minute. Let's hope this works. Uh, so the, you can play it online really nice. And we pick who we're going to be. There's one of 24 game characters. Uh, and the game's decided to hang up, so I'm going to have to talk you through it rather than rather than play. But what happens is we, we are one of these characters and we have an opponent that we're playing against who's another one. Uh, and what we have to do is take turns to ask yes or no questions to try and work out who the other person's character is. And we want to find out who their character is before they find out ours. So I could ask a question such as, is your character male or female? Or is your character wearing glasses? Or is your character wearing a hat? And when I get the answer to that question, I can eliminate the possibilities that don't match that. So if the answer comes back, my character is a female, then I can eliminate all the men on this board because I know that the opponent is not them. And I go from 24 possibilities down to say eight or 10 or 12 or however many females there are. And we keep asking questions to narrow down the possibilities here. So I guess there's a really nice way to start thinking about what information is. Because information is all about questions and answers. Information is the amount by which one variable, whether that's the answer to a question, a signal, or a measurement, reduces our uncertainty or surprises us about the value of another variable. So in order to quantify information, we need to quantify both what uncertainty is, in terms of the entropy is the fundamental measure there, and what uncertainty reduction is, which is information. And the fundamental measure there is known as mutual information. I'm not going to go into the maths if you haven't seen it before. I just want you to take the concept away of what we, what we mean here. And we can recognise both of these concepts in the game of Guess Who. We can see that we started out with uncertainty about the other person's character. It could have been one of 24 characters at the start of the game. Then we ask a question, are you male or female? We get an answer and we can eliminate some of those pieces on the board. So instead of having one of 24 possibilities that it could be, it comes down to maybe one in 10. So we are less uncertain at that, that point about the person's identity. We had a reduction in uncertainty, and that's what information is, the amount by which that uncertainty was reduced. As I say, I'm not going to go into the, the maths today. Uh, there's some really nice uh, Venn diagram interpretations of what uh, these quantities are. We can think about uh, this set here representing the uncertainty we had about some variable x, and this here representing the uncertainty we had about some variable y, and we can think about their overlap information that tells us about both of them as being their joint information or mutual information, how much we find out about Y when we learn about X. So let's think then about how we can use these concepts uh, to measure what's going on in the world around us. We can apply it to guess who and ask a lot of questions such as how surprising is it to find out that the sex of the person is female? We can ask how much uncertainty we had about the identity of the person. We can ask how much that uncertainty was reduced when we found out one of the features. For example, on average, when we find out the hair colour, how much did that reduce our uncertainty? We can go beyond averages and talk about specifics. If we found out the person's hair colour was red, how much information did that give us specifically? We can ask about the information in common between two features. 
How much information do we get about the sex of the person if we find, sorry, how much do we get, how much do we find out about the sex of the person being female if we found out their hair colour was red? And we can ask about that information in context. How much did we find out about their sex being female from their hair colour being red if we already knew they were wearing a hat? All of these questions have direct analogues in neuroscience. We can think about a classic face house discrimination task and ask exactly the same questions. How surprising would it be to find out that the object was a face? How much uncertainty was there about the object in the first place? How much was that uncertainty reduced if we measure the activity in region one of the brain? Or specifically, will we see the, the uh, activity in that region was 0.8? How much information did that give us about the object? And we can go further and start to talk about functional relationships. What if we measure the activity in these two different regions in the brain and we find they're 0.8 and 0.2? How much information do they have in common in that situation? And how much information will we see in common if I also told you the activity in a third region here? So information theory allows us to answer questions that are very naturally phrased in neuroscience. It allows us to answer these in a model-free way that captures nonlinearities and provides estimators for different data types, uh, such as you know, we might want to ask the same questions on fMRI, continuous valued activity, versus spiking activity, which is uh, more binary in some sense. We can also naturally extend these questions to multivariate uh, analyses, which is not possible with, uh, straight, in a straightforward fashion with things like correlations. The questions uh, that I ran through before are very classic questions for information theory and neuroscience, about the nature of neural codes, about bridging task and implementation levels, about functional relationships. What we want to do, though, in thinking about information processing is move uh, to more dynamic questions about how information changes through time, to ask about dynamic interactions, not static relationships. And so to get at these questions, we need to go a little bit further. So thinking about the question of how to model neural information processing dynamics. We've talked about thinking, thinking of how inputs are mapped to outputs through the system and how we can talk about how information is stored within a variable and how it's transferred from others. And so starting to put that into place, the way I've, I've drawn this is thinking about the system as a whole, as a computational entity. But we know from what we talked about before, the information processing is not really uh, it's not best to think about it in a system-wide way. We want to get at what's happening inside the system at many points in space and time. So we need to dig a bit deeper there. And so what we want to do is think about multivariate time series of states in our systems, within the systems themselves. And so we're thinking about systems that have many variables or, or nodes, and each of those nodes have some time series of activity. And we want to ask how those time series, how information is processed, in the, uh, in the evolution of those time series. These time series could be fMRI, where each node here might be a, a voxel or a region, and we look at the, uh, the bold activity of those over time. It could be MEG, for example, where we've got beamform sources and their activity over time, or really anything else. And so what we're trying to do from an information processing perspective is to look at how each point in space and time is computed from what came before. So if we focus on the next value of variable x, whatever variable x is, we're trying to ask the question of how that gets computed. Where did the information come from in that computation? How much of it was stored in the past of x and how much came from other variables in the system? So we've recognised that uh, in order to study information processing, we're thinking about local computations all across the system. We're thinking not so much about some computational system-wide entity, but thinking about each variable in the system as a computational entity itself, which stores information in it, takes information in from others, and those pieces of information are coupled across the system in and out of each other. We can see inputs here, we can see outputs, we can see rules or algorithms in some sense inside each of our computational entities here. But we're not going to tr explicitly construct each of these computational entities in our model. Our model's simply going to ask about how that model would incorporate information storage and information transfer. If we look at the computation of this next state here, let's measure how much information from the past was stored in the past of that variable that contributed to its next value, and how much information was transferred from others. 
and looking at the information processing in this way is going to start to align with the questions I outlined before of interest in how information is processed in complex systems like this. And it will allow us to establish an information theoretic footprint for what's going on in the dynamics. In the next couple of slides, I'll show you the, the first couple of measures that we use in this way. We start by looking at information storage in the system. Information storage asks, in that computation of the next value here, how much would information will we attribute as having come from the past of that variable? So we measure that using something called the active information storage, which is a mutual information that asks how much information from the past, uh, from the past multivariate block of states of that variable could we find in the next value there. So it's the information from the past state that's in use in predicting the next value. And this could capture internally stored information inside the variable itself. It could capture information that's stored in a distributed fashion that leaves the variable into some other node in the system and comes back later on. Or it could capture regularities in the inputs that drive that variable. Regardless, when we're forming a computational model, we would attribute it as information stored in the model. This concept of information storage underpins periodic behaviour, stability, self-regularity, self-prediction and, and the concept of memory. So we can easily see that it's something that will be useful to measure. We might want to ask how much memory was involved in a particular area in a computational task and how that related to the stages of the task. We can also measure this in a time resolved manner, looking at every point in time and seeing how the use of information storage fluctuates and again relate that to a computational task. The second main measure that we use is information transfer. So once we have accounted for how much information from the past of a variable was used in computing its next state, we're now interested in how much information came from other variables. We use a transfer entropy to measure this. How much information can I see in some source variable about the update in my target variable given what I already saw in the past? And it's a conditional mutual information, for those of you that know the maths, between the source and the target next state given the past. So it's asking how much information on average do we have from the source that helps predict this next value in the context of the past. It's a Granger-like measure for those of you who know Granger causality. And in fact, when we measure transfer entropy using a linear model, they turn out to be one and the same thing. So transfer entropy models the strength of predictive effect or statistical dependence, and it captures information flow in our model. It has obvious applications in neuroscience where we're often asking how much information we can see transferred from region one to region two, how that varies through time, how it changes with cognitive task or underlying condition. What it's measuring is a dynamic flow of information, not a static relationship between our variables. And it's the second step in our modeling process of what's happening in the update of our variable X. We already looked at the information storage. We accounted for the information in the past of the variable. Accounting for information transfer from another variable is the second step in that information regression. Uh, and that's one way to look at it. We're kind of regressing what's happening in the information processing here. Again, without going through the maths, we've looked at the first couple of stages in that re regression. There are more complicated things that we can do. We can look at higher order terms, uh, joint transfer from multiple variables to a target and so on, but we won't go into those today. And of course, we can look at time resolve measures as well, so we can look at how it changes through time. An edge time series, which you might have heard about recently, can be thought of as a special case uh, of this. So with that framework in place, how do we use it to study information processing in complex systems, and in particular in neuroscience? We've used it for empirical analysis across all of these examples that we can see here. And so in, in talking about how we've done that and moving towards how we use it in neuroscience, I want to return to this view of this interaction between uh, theory, enabling tools, and applications. The theory is obviously very important. We've already talked through a lot of the theory in terms of how we think about information processing in these complex systems in the first place. But it's not complete. Often we need to go back and think about how we would alter these measures. How would we think about information transfer in a new way given a new type of data? Or we might need to make new developments in order to address different questions. For example, in the next talk, Abed Macker is going to talk about something called information decomposition, which goes inside these measures and tries to break them apart further. Moving on then from the theory, we need enabling tools if we want to put this theory into practice. 
This comes down to having good empirical estimators that can take data sets like fMRI or MEG or spike trains and actually make these measures from the data and tell us something interesting about the system. A lot of our work has been on enabling tools, in particular software, making software tools that uh, can be used to estimate these measures nice and easily. I've been involved in a couple of different software projects here, principally JODT and IDT Excel for this purpose. I'll show you very briefly the JODT toolkit. We've tried to make this as easy to use as possible. Our vision is that people should be able to measure information storage and transfer in their data sets as easily as they can use a spreadsheet. So we put a nice GUI front end on it where you come in and you pick the measure that you want to use. Uh, you pick the measure that you want to use. You pick which estimator for the particular type of data you want to apply. You come in and you choose uh, your data set. You set some properties, which I won't go into at the moment, and you press the uh, compute button and get a nice answer, which we can also add a statistical significance test to that. Let's, let's do that. So we get a nice answer. We get a p-value for how significant it was. And we also get code in Java, Python, and MATLAB that we can take and build on to do more complicated things. So the aim for this toolkit is to, to make it as easy for people to use as possible. And we've also got uh, a series of video lectures that you can use in conjunction with the toolkit to learn more about these measures, to learn more about using the toolkit, and to learn more about the parameters that you might want to set in different ways if you're trying to do more complicated things. I should say the links for all of this uh, are, in, um, are in the slides. I'll give you the link at the end so you don't need to write them down. So that's the, that's the empirical tools. And then we can start to move forward to applications. And the applications here are, are many and varied. As I've said before, uh, we're trying to make, we're, we're always trying to think about how these measures can be used to answer interesting questions about uh, interesting questions about the brain and other complex systems. For example, we can uh, ask about how much information is transferred from one region to another. How does that change in time? How does that change according to cognitive ta task? How does it change according to the condition or disease that the person has? So we're always thinking about using these measures to answer interesting questions, and that's a really important thing, because without that, they're not, not actually genuinely useful. I'll look at categorising the kinds of things we can do on the next slide, but before doing that, I want to refer you to the work of uh, other people who've been very active in this area, because it certainly hasn't just been us. There's been some great work out of the Vibra Lab, out of uh, the Marinazzo Group. Damien Battaglia is here. Uh, Sebi Stramalia, John Beggs, uh, Masanori Shimono will speak in our workshop in a couple of days as well. So there's a lot of really interesting work going on here. And so completing the loop here, I think this link from applications back to theory is important. There's really strong feedback there. It's not just sitting there uh, contemplating the nature of information processing and what can we say about the brain. It's taking feedback about what are important questions that people are interested in neuroscience and how can we adapt what we're doing in order to answer those, those questions uh, either at all or in a better way. And so after I show you some categories of applications, I'm going to take one and do a deep dive thinking about how uh, these different pieces of work fit together. So let's start with the categorisation though. What can such modelling tell us about neural information processing overall? And the way I categorise it is to firstly think about the way information processing can characterise different regimes of behaviour. So as I said before, we can ask about the information flow between two regions and we can ask how that changes under different neural conditions, for example, or under different tasks. So one thing that we've done there is, be, is have been looking at uh, the way information storage changes between uh, ASD subjects and normal controls and found interesting differences in different brain regions for that, indicating less predictability at the neural level, not just the macroscopic level. We've also looked at how these measures change with respect to stimuli and task, and also regarding transitions between subcritical and supercritical states through criticality. We've been able to identify uh, that information flow is strongly associated with more integrated states whereas information storage is more, uh, more associated with segregated states. The second large category for how these measures can be used is looking at unrolling the space-time dynamics of what's going on in information processing in the brain. We can highlight information processing hotspots and use information processing to explain the dynamics that are going on. A classic example here is thinking about a person who can 
press a left or a right button and looking at the way information processing is different from the left and right motor cortex to the cerebellum at the point at which the button is pushed and we can see very, diff very large differences in information flow between those two cases. We've also been using the measures to try and look at uh, validating conjectures on how uh, information is processed in the brain. Looking at, we've had a, several papers looking at predictive coding, using the measures to go in and investigate what the hypotheses say about where information, where and when information should be stored and transferred. And we can identify when areas of the brain are surprised because the prior failed. We can identify when updates come through in information transfer to update those priors and so on that align really nicely with predictive coding hypotheses. The third major area is looking at functional and effective network modelling. There are obvious uh, applications of, of taking measures of information flow and making networks out of that that represent the information flow between the different nodes in our network. And this adds uh, to standard views on functional networks because we can now do this in a non-linear fashion and we can even do multivariate, uh, multivariate analysis here as well. It also adds to the effective network modelling side of things. So using uh, multivariate uh, measures of transfer entropy allows to capture sets of parents that inform, uh, sets of parent sources in a network that inform us about a target and form uh, a minimal circuit model uh, that describes the dynamics of what's taking place. That gives us a more data-driven approach versus the model comparison of DCM and allows us to actually go to much greater scales than have been uh, possible for analysis before. So what I want to do for, for the rest of the talk is do a deep dive into one particular area that kind of covers uh, this, this nice loop between theory enabling tools and applications and also covers those three different categories of application that I mentioned before. And this is looking at information flow between spike trains. So here specifically what I mean is if we have a spike train for one neuron, uh, maybe we've measured it over half an hour and we have the same recording for a second neuron, we can come in and we can measure information flow between the two. Do we see an information flow from X to Y? Or do we see an information flow from Y to X? Or is there a non-trivial flow of information in, in both directions? And how does that change according to, for example, time? or the regime of behaviour, or development time, and so on. So there's a lot of promise for what, what we can do here. There's kind of a, an, an application pull in some sense. Uh, we have increasingly uh, high precision in our spatial and temporal recordings uh, at the neural level. So this promises, uh, this offers the possibility that we can come in and study information flows directly at that level and learn more about what's happening in the information processing at that very fundamental level. And indeed, transfer entropy has been used uh, to a large extent already in analysing spike trains with a traditional kind of estimator that we call the discrete time estimator. And so it's been used to, to look at directed functional networks and to study their properties, such as long tail degree distributions, the emergence of rich club, relation of hubs to specific time scales, and so on. But there's something a little bit lacking in the applications that were there so far. And this comes down to when I mentioned that it was a very uh, traditional uh, estimator that was used here, this discrete time estimator. So to understand this, let's have a look at how uh, transfer entropy would be used on spike trains at the moment. So if we have our spike trains, well, our original recordings, X and Y, to make them nice clean spike trains, we have to do some pre-processing, obviously generally some kind of thresholding to identify where the spikes are. That results in a set of timestamps for where the spikes are. They're not really a time series just yet. To turn them into a time series, the simplest thing to do is to do some sort of discrete time binning, where we select some time resolution delta T, we go and put these bin edges down and then look at inside each bin, do we have a spike or do we not have a spike? And then we get a nice binary time series here for X and Y, which we can come back and then apply transfer entropy to, to ask whether the past, uh, the past of Y helps us predict the next value of X given the past. And so that's, that's what people have been doing. But it, it leaves a big question of how to set this time resolution here. And it's an important question because it's been shown that the transfer entropy itself is highly variable depending on what the value of this delta T uh, time resolution is. And that's problematic, not just because we don't know which, which one is the right answer, uh, but how we use the transfer entropy 
is, uh, is very much affected by that. So Ito and all from the, the BEGS group had this nice application where they were simply using the transfer entropy on these spike trains to look at distinguishing whether or not there was a, a non-trivial connection, whether or not there was a, a conditional dependence or conditional independence from the, from the target on the source. And the, so what they're looking at is uh, changing the bin size here on the x-axis, looking at the performance uh, in a model of determining whether there was a true connection or not. And that performance was hugely variable as we var varied the bin size. So that's a problem. And we can understand in some sense why that is. If we set our bin size too small here, so these, if we imagine these, uh, these bin edges coming closer and closer together, we start to have a problem in representing long dependencies in the system. We know that spike trains have dependencies up to hundreds of milliseconds long. So if we set our bin size down to on the millisecond level, we would have to have hundreds of bins in order to capture that dependence. And we start to have a problem of dimensionality. We just can't numerically do things with that many bins. It just doesn't work. We can't represent the space properly. On the other hand, if we relax our bin sizes and have them quite large, maybe on the tens or even hundreds of millisecond level, we might be able to capture those long interactions uh, on paper, but we're losing a lot of the timing subtleties, and especially in the specific timing between the source and target, we start to lose that. So neither extreme seems to, to work very well, so we need to have a, a rethink. And so what we did was to go back to move from the application pool here to move back to the theory and think about how to properly formulate transfer entropy in continuous time. This was a very mathematical paper, so I won't go through all the details. Suffice to say, we realised we had to do something very different and think about transfer entropy in terms of rates and path integrals. And in the end, as I say, without going through the details, we came to a final, um, uh, a final expression for what transfer entropy should look like for spike trains. And it turned out we needed to think about rates. So the reason that the transfer entropy changed itself as we changed our delta t was that it was supposed to change. What is consistent in theory would, was a rate as we took the limit of that bin size to zero. And again, I won't go through the details, but the expression itself was fairly simple. And it turned out that we really only needed to look at the target spikes and look at uh, how much we expected to see that given spike, given the histories of the source and target itself versus if we only looked at the source alone. The stronger, uh, the stronger uh, our expectation of a spike was when we looked at adding the source in to our model, the more transfer entropy we had. And again, without going too far into the mathematics there, it offered a new way to estimate, uh, estimate transfer entropy between spike trains, which promised to be more efficient. And that's what we tackled in our next paper. This was work from uh, my PhD student, David uh, David Shorten, where he translated that theoretical formulation into an estimation algorithm. So given data, given those spike trains, how much information flow would we identify from X to Y and Y to X or vice versa? So again, without going into too many details about the algorithm David came up with, it was a really clever algorithm that worked out how to represent those dependencies based on inter-spike intervals. And that allowed us to produce a very efficient estimator. So instead of making a time binning on the spike trains here, we looked at capturing their dependencies in terms of their inter-spike intervals. And that allowed us to produce, uh, I just noticed that diagram is flipped left to right. I don't know how I did that. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> anyway, um, it allows us to, to produce a very efficient estimation here. We could capture very long dependencies in the data by representing uh, the dependencies in this way. And when we compared uh, the, use, the performance of this estimator, this continuous time estimator to discrete time, it beat it hands down every way. It was very consistent. So here what we're looking at is a situation where uh, we've got a very simple uh, dependence between the, the source and the target, so we could mathematically write down what the transfer entropy should be. Our continuous time estimator was very consistent. It gave the right answer, or very close to it, even with down to 100 spikes, and it was not dependent on the parameters uh, in any meaningful way, whereas the discrete time estimator, the answer was all over the place. It was highly dependent on the, 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 the binning interval as well as highly dependent on the number of spikes that we had there. So that was a really good advance. And one of the extra, uh, one of the extra validations uh, that we performed was looking at this nice model of the pyloric circuit of the crustacean uh, stromatogastric ganglion. It's a model from the Eve Marta group 
which had had Granger causality applied to it before and found that it couldn't really tease apart where there were and where there were not uh, non-trivial connections or conditional uh, dependence or independence between the different components. Uh, the reason is that we have really complex bursting behaviour here. We have high correlations between all of the elements in the system. Uh, and there are very uh, complex, highly periodic behaviour at play here, and it's very hard to see what is and what is not connected. The discrete time estimator couldn't do it. It had uh, a lot of false positives. It was really only the continuous time estimator that could, could tease that apart. And as I say, we were quite happy with that because Granger causality had been applied a lot before using the more traditional estimator type. But let's move on properly to, to applications. And so what, what we did as a first application was to make use of an open data set of multi-electrode array recordings of a developing, uh, developing neural cell cultures. Uh, we chose this, it's the, the Wagner data set that's a little bit old now, but it was one of the only ones that looked at, one of the only open ones that looked at the development trajectory of cell cultures and had long overnight recordings on multiple days in vitro. So what we did is we uh, examined the all pairs directed functional network here. I think we had about 60 electrodes, so we looked at the all pairs uh, information flows between those, and we used the uh, we use the multi-unit activity rather than spike sorting because we wanted to identify how the information flows changed at each unit over time. And if we spike sorted on any particular day, we couldn't really do that because we couldn't identify the same neuron on different days. Now what we found uh, was firstly that uh, information flow only seemed to emerge after about eight or nine days in vitro. There was pretty much nothing there to measure at all in the interactions between the units before that. And that made me think yesterday, or in, in Michael's talk, looking at the, the seemingly independent um, uh, uh, traces that were seen in, uh, in, in the babies that had poor development. After uh, those eight or nine uh, days in vitro, though, the system seemed to burst to life, and we could see uh, transfer entropy rising very quickly, so very strong interactions started very quickly in the system. And what was interesting about those strong interactions or information flows was that they seemed to lock in very quickly. Almost as soon as they appeared, they stayed over quite some time. So once they, once they appeared, we started to see correlations in those information flows if we compared an earlier day to a later day. What I'm showing here is for two different cultures, we're plotting uh, the average information flow out from a node uh, on an earlier day to the same information out on a later day. And we can see really strong correlations after about day 15 or so to a later day that held up over at least a week. They decayed a little bit when we started to go towards uh, correlations across two weeks, but there's still a little bit there. So that was really interesting. Uh, and then we also saw that uh, the information transfer, that the, the, the nodes involved in the, the system took on different computational roles during the bursts. So we saw uh, that nodes would take on roles as either transmitters of information, receivers of information, or mediators of information, as had been proposed by the Bullmore Group uh, some years before. But now we could look at this in a directional fashion. So on this diagram here, again, we're looking at two different cultures where on different days in vitro, we're plotting on the x-axis the information flow out of a node, on, on the y-axis the information flow into that node. And what we could see is that after some time the system started to organise itself in these bursts, where nodes which uh, transferred a lot of information out did not transfer much information, did not receive much information, and vice versa, nodes that received much information did not transfer much information out. And those computational roles align really nicely with the positions of the nodes in the burst. It was the early bursts that transferred a lot of information out and the late ones that received a lot of information. Those patterns also tended to lock in over time and the roles of the nodes locked in as well. And we can see this visually here. We've got much stronger patterns here on the later days than we have earlier, but we can see some traces starting to form. Interestingly, we've got very similar results when we performed the same analyses on a synthetic model which was developing according to STDP. So that kind of completes the loop from applications pulling in that new theory was required, putting new enabling tools out there, uh, and then bringing that through to new applications to study the nature of development of information flows in developing neural cell cultures. I chose this example partly because uh, it allows us to illustrate everything happening around this loop, and also partly because it hits those three different categories that we talked about before, looking at comparing 
information flows across different regimes, looking at space-time patterns and looking at directed functional networks. The next step to take this to is to bring uh, this new estimator into a, uh, inferring effective network structure in uh, spiking, spiking neurons. Uh, and that's a, the subject of our poster tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, please come in and have a chat then. Now, I'm not gonna go uh, deeply into the, the second example here. Uh, I didn't plan to, but I did put on the slides because I wanted to give you a little taster because my former student, Leo Novelli, is going to talk about effective network modeling using these measures in our Methods of Information Theory workshop on Wednesday. Uh, so I'd love you to come along and, and see uh, Leo's talk there. So just to, to whet your appetite, what I wanted to mention is that, uh, what I wanted to mention is that, uh, as I said before, information flow is really kind of obviously placed to look at, uh, to look at the, this inverse problem of inferring effective network structure, inferring a minimal set of parents that contribute information to the computation in a particular target node. It offers the possibility for us to do a fully data-driven approach rather than a model comparison approach. It has some similarities, obviously, to DCM in being uh, in being um, effectively Bayesian based as well, but in, in making it fully data driven, we can handle much larger systems than can be done there at the moment. We've worked on the theory side, as have a lot of others in this field. We've worked on enabling tools, putting together the IDT Excel toolkit exactly for this purpose. And Leo in particular has worked on applications, primarily at the moment being validating that it works and it works at scale. We can go up to hundreds of nodes, thousands, even 10,000, 10, tens of thousands of time steps, and it works really well. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's the story for, for Leo's talk. So to finish off, uh, to finish off, what we've talked about is our view on how to model information processing in complex systems in general, and specifically how this naturally allows us to answer meaningful questions in a neuroscience setting. Uh, I've talked you through the way I think this nexus between the theory of what information processing is, the enabling tools to allow us to study this empirically, and then those applications, and the feedback then back into the theory. I've talked about how that feedback loop, I think, is really important in helping us to forge this path, and we talked about the classifications of the different kinds of things we can do with these measures of information processing in a neuroscience setting. We can characterise different regimes of behaviour, we can look at space-time characterisations of the dynamics of information processing or information dynamics, and we can look at directed functional and effective network inference. I'll finish with a couple of plugs. Um, I'll, I'll do the, the last one first. If you wanted any of the links uh, in the talk today, you can grab uh, the slides from there, or alternatively, you can see my Twitter feed and I've pasted a link to the slides uh, on that. The open source toolkits are, are there uh, and really easy to use. Uh, I'm always happy to answer questions uh, about that. We love seeing these used to, uh, to address more questions uh, than we possibly have time to look at ourselves, so please do grab that if you're interested. Uh, I also want to plug the information theory workshop on Tuesday and Wednesday. If this sounded interesting, there's a lot more, even more interesting uh, talks than what I can say that are going to be occurring on, on Tuesday and Wednesday, so I'd love to see you come along to that. And uh, if, 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 if there's anyone in this room that uh, is not already doing a PhD or doesn't already have one and is interested in this, come and chat to me. Uh, I need more hands to do, <laughs> to do this work. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very, very interesting talk. Um, while you think about your questions and, and do line up at the microphones, we're going to have a, quite, a couple of quick announcements from, from Tatiana. <clears throat> Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Joe. So my name is Tanya Kamineva. I'm from Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia. I am on a local organizing committee, and I'm also on the program committee for OCNS. My first CNS was in 2013 in Paris, so that was very interesting after doing PhD in control theory. That was my first neuroscience type conference. That was fun. I would like to thank everyone who come, came here, especially those people who traveled long way from overseas. I know it's long way, so now you know how we feel when we come to Europe, that it's jet lag, it's long, it's expensive. 
As well, I also would like to say that it's very unfortunate that not all people were able to come because of conflicts all around the world, so it's very unfortunate. I would like to remind everyone uh, to put posters up, especially posters 1 to 60, they are today. We also have extra poster boards. If you have any poster that you brought with you but didn't register for this poster, you're welcome to put it up on extra boards. As well, I encourage everyone to attend a poster session today from 3.50 until 6 or 6.50, I think. And uh, uh, talk to our PhD students and postdocs about their recent work. I think it's the first time we have face-to-face -face interactions in two years. I encourage everyone to talk to everyone. Dinner is at 7 o'clock today at Ariel. It's just three minutes work. As you exit through the glass doors, turn left, three minutes, and you're there. People who registered for dinner, you should have a dinner ticket uh, inside your uh, sachet. So could you please confirm that you have this dinner voucher? Morning tea will be served upstairs. Afternoon tea will be served downstairs, close to the poster area. I would like to ask all speakers to upload their presentations, please, at least one hour before your talks. Uh, you can do that in the speaker room 101 upstairs. If you have any questions, please talk with people with red lanyards. So this is local organizing committee and volunteers as well. And thank you very much. All right, so we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Uh, if, if there are any, I have one, so I'll start us off. I've always been a bit of a skeptic of this whole information flow um, theory, not because of the theory, but because of the application. Can you give us a feel for how much data you actually need to estimate these things yeah. sensibly? Yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. And um, I'm gonna be slippery and say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on, on what kind of question that you want to ask. So let's, let's go back and have a look at, at some of these. Uh, it, it depends on what kind of question you want to ask. So we always have, um, with these measures, we always think about the statistical significance of them. So that's why uh, I, I added this to the, the talk. And it came up in conversation with, with Axel yesterday, uh, actually. So you know, when we get a measurement out, we always want to check if, it, if it's something that's statistically significant, if it's something that's you know, just consistent with the noise floor, if we're really measuring something. And so that's how we always tell, do we have enough data or not to say something sensible in the first place? So if we don't have enough data, maybe we only have 100 time samples, okay, maybe we're not going to see anything. But we know that from, from looking at the statistical significance. Beyond that, uh, let's, uh, let's go back to the, the slides here. So beyond that, uh, you're right, the more data we have, the better the measurements that we can make. And that's shown in, um, in this particular slide here, we're looking at uh, whether our, our new estimator of spike trains in continuous time works well or not. And we can see for the discrete time estimator, there are big differences in terms of how much data we have. Uh, so for not much data, we're getting something that's very wrong and it, it gets better as the more data we have. But when you have good estimators, you don't really see, uh, you don't really see such a big change for example. So here with our good continuous time estimator, we're getting really good estimates of what's going on down to only 100 spikes, uh, which is really nice. Um, now I say it, it depends because it does depend. It depends on a lot. You know, so here there are some things we can do with only 100 spikes. We can do more things. If we have more spikes, we can see that the, the error bars get a lot lower, so it's much easier. Uh, if we've got a weak interaction, it becomes much easier to tell the difference between that and noise the more samples we have. Um, but it's, we can do things with realistic amounts of data. So coming back to, to this experiment here where we looked at the developing cell cultures. So I said we picked this particularly because we had overnight recordings that gave us a lot of data, but we didn't use the whole overnight recordings. We used um, between uh, 1,000 and 10,000 spikes for each, for each of them, and that was more like a half hour recording, I think, which was, which was realistic. And coming back to... Um, Moving on to the example about the effective network analysis. So what Leo is going to talk about in his work uh, is that you know we can now do this on realistic sized data sets. So thinking about say whole brain fMRI from the HCP project, you've got you know, in one parcellation you've got maybe 330 nodes, maybe a thousand time steps, and we can do interesting things even at that scale. Uh, 
uh, that, that works. It, it, it works in terms of time. It works in terms of what we can see. The more data we have, the more we can see, but we can see things at realistic time scales as well. Yeah, very cool. Uh, thank you very much. We have one more question here. Thanks. Yeah, good. Um, so kind of following on um, in a similar vein, I think you mentioned that you think uh, the approach that you've outlined here has got some big benefits over things that are uh, approaches that are model driven like dy dynamic causal modeling. I wonder if you could just expand on, on where, where you see those advantages are. Um, I think you mentioned that you, they were in terms of scale, but uh, you know, any advantages that you, you see or differences I'd be keen to hear about. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to go too much into it because I kind of really uh, only gave a very cursory outline of, of the way this algorithm works. It's probably something that, well, it's definitely something that Leo will go more into in our workshop in a couple of days' time. Um, there are advantages, certainly, uh, but in some sense they're, they're kind of apples and oranges as well. So, so here, it's not even so much about uh, model-driven versus, versus model-free. It's not even so much about that. Um, it's not even so much about that. that. That's partly what comes into play, but we can always make good estimates of information flow with a good model. If the model is good and we know uh, you know, given uh, a model for how these two are interacting, if we've got good maths to solve what the information transfer should look like, if we fit the model, we can do information transfer given a model. It's not that uh, having a model is a bad thing. That can actually be very helpful here. And I think there are good opportunities down the track to build, to bring this approach and bring DCM together actually and make something, something nice and new. And I know Leo's been thinking a lot about that. Uh, the advantages are more in terms of uh, the way the inference uh, that we run works and the way uh, DCM at the moment works. So what we try and do is to build up, um, build up a parent set for how this node is being computed. So thinking about where the information is coming from in the past of this time series and then which other nodes and which particular time steps of those nodes are, produ uh, are contributing information into the computation of this, uh, of this variable here. And we do this in, in a kind of greedy or iterative fashion. We start, we, we test all the nodes first and see who's the strongest contributor. We pick that one out, then we go back and, and re-evaluate all of the nodes as sources and pick out the next best source. And we keep doing that until we exhaust statistical power in the data. And so we kind of iteratively build up this parent set. And that takes a lot of time to run. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, but it does save you compared to a model comparison approach, which is what the main way DCM is currently, currently working. It kind of, uh, what it does is compare two different models and see which one is better. And there have been some ways that they've been working on to try and look at um, exploring the whole space of models and finding where the best, the best one is, but you can't, you just don't have time to compare every single one of those models. So at the moment, it, it's more an algorithmic thing about why this can work at scale. Uh, rather than um, rather than the formulation of, of model model based versus model free, does that make sense? And I think because of that formulation, I think there are good possibilities to to bring them together and bring the benefits of both uh, together down the track. Okay, we have time for one more question there. Hi, Joe. Uh, hey. Hey, long time no see. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question more related to the applications because I'm normally feeding in images into an artificial neural network. And I'm kind of interested in how you would best quantify the initial level of information, so within an image, before you feed it in within the network. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, can you be more specific about, are you talking about like two-dimensional two -dimensional, static images? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, that's a very generic question. I'm not 100% not sure how to address it. So you're asking about how much information there is in, in the image as a whole? In, yeah, or? in the content of an image before you feed it in through layers of a network. Yeah. So that you can maybe better quantify, like if, I don't know, if there's a maximum peak when you train the network that it's able to learn the information within the image, whether it's gained more information than what's in the initial image. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the answer, again, the answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends. So in assessing how much information there is in, in any variable, uh, we have to construct some probability distribution for that variable itself. And so with the images here, 
um, how much information there is in the image itself? Well, it, it depends on what you're comparing that to. So are we just thinking about, so maybe the images are, say it's MNIST and you're looking at um, digits. Uh, so the amount of information that you might see about, about an image is really, well, which one of these 10 digits is it? So technically that's, that's not so much information if you think about it like that. But if you're thinking about, um, if you're thinking about exactly where the strokes are and even within one image, the strokes are in very different places, Okay, well then there's, there's more information that we can account for there. If it's uh, you know, not just about images, if it's not just about digits, but now we're thinking about MNIST digits in the context of um, you know, we're adding them to a database that has natural scenes as well, then distinguishing the two requires more information again and it kind of, it kind of grows. So the answer kind of is it depends. It depends on exactly what kind of information that you're talking about that you want to be able to distinguish. Uh, it depends on what's in the data set. Um, we might have to talk about this in more detail because I'm not sure I'm 100% grasping what, what you're getting at. I, I can give a more solid example, but maybe we can chat later. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe uh, I, yeah, we do run out of time, but I think we can take one last question. Sorry, maybe two last questions, but be quick. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, your analysis on the information flow will pretty much depend on how you define the state variables, right? Absolutely. So there's a, always been an issue about the rate coding versus temporal coding. Mm -hmm. And when you discuss the uh, information flow uh, with respect to the uh, this uh, in vitro cultures demonstrating the bursting dynamics, what do you think will be more appropriate for whether you define it as a, when you define the state variable for that application, you, I think you define it as a the interspike interval, right? But when you use, let's say, uh, firing rate, hmm. then what kind of things that you can discuss? Have you done that before? Hmm. It, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so we, we go into the discussion of that a little bit in, in the paper, um, more so than, than I'll be able to do here. But you're absolutely right. You know, you've got this competing, this competing idea of whether um, time-based coding or rate-based coding is, is really capturing what's going on. The estimator itself is kind of agnostic to that. Uh, it could pick up both. So what we're really looking at here is uh, when a spike occurs in the target, we're looking at um, we're looking at comparison of whether that spike was uh, more expected if we looked at both the the target and the source histories, or uh, if we just looked at the the target history alone. And in representing that expect, expectation of whether we would see a spike or not, we're using the ISIs uh, to build the probability space. So that allows us to capture information that is encoded in the rates themselves, because if it's encoded in the rates, then all that's important about those ISIs is effectively what the average rate that we could perceive from them was. But it also allows us to capture information that might be in the specifics of these ISIs as well. Uh, it's an estimator that's agnostic to, to the tool. It would capture both. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to go at something that was more rate driven and wasn't so much worried about the specific ISI pattern, uh, that would be fairly straightforward. You could come back to the, the maths, which as I said, I didn't really go into detail, but looking at that comparison of the expected spike rate, what you could do is in representing the histories is not look at the specific ISI pattern, but you could say, Tell me the expected spike rate on the target now, given the spike rate that I saw before, so not the ISI pattern, but give me the rate on the, on the target and give me the rate on the source as well and build your model that way. So you could do something more specific if you wanted to restrict it to, to rate-based information only. Um, the current estimate is kind of agnostic to the two. Okay, thank you. No worries. Thanks. I had a quick question about benchmarking or kind of proving the estimator. Hmm. I expected perhaps to see figures where you have a synthetic model network with um, weighted vertices next to the estimated weight. Yep. Um, and discussion of where the strengths and, and perhaps some uh, weaknesses are in the estimators. Yep. yep. Yeah, good, good question. There's a lot more in the paper than, than what I've shown you here. I've just taken some uh, really simple examples to, uh, to illustrate here. Um, the paper includes, uh, yeah, looking at several different examples, looking at where we know what the real transfer entropy is and whether we can get that or not versus the discrete time estimator, looking at situations where we do or don't have a real connection uh, 
and whether we can determine that uh, statistically or not. We looked at whole networks of coupled um, uh, leaf neurons, I think, and looked at, okay, well, where does it find stronger connections? Where does it doesn't? There's, there's a whole set in there. Uh, but just to pick up on what you said about um, the actual strength. So the transfer entropy doesn't really, it doesn't really tell you about the actual strength of a connection. In some sense, okay, you might expect a stronger connection to have stronger transfer, but it's highly dependent on the network uh, that that particular pair is embedded in. You may or may not see stronger transfer entropy from a strong link depending on uh, the embedding there, depending on how um, how much memory there was in the in the driving source and so on. So there's not really, you know, the strength of a connection is kind of a causal concept. This isn't really causal. It's about uh, building a model of the dynamics, which is which is subtly different. We can talk about that more um, uh, in the break if you like. But there is a, a subtle distinction there. Uh, and as I said, there's a lot more examples in in the paper if you want to dig into those. I hope that's a, a decent answer for you. Yeah, I think we, we need to stop there. The cafe is waiting, so thank you very much, Joe. No worries, thank you.